We are still considering, as most of you will recall, the first two verses in the twelfth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I've reminded you many times already that this is a most important and crucial statement. This is the point at which so many have in past centuries broken down in their Christian life, the point at which so many still break down. Here is one of those vital links which we must always consider most carefully. You'll find the same link in every epistle in the New Testament. And we ignore it only, I say, at our gravest peril. Now, I'm particularly anxious that we should all see uh, that this is not only important in and of itself, but that it is particularly important at the present time, in the situation in which the Christian Church finds herself and all of us as members of the Church. I trust that week by week I am showing you the immediate practical relevance of this tremendous statement that the Apostle makes here. Here in two verses he really sums up uh, the whole of the Christian uh, the gospel teaching with regard to conduct and behavior. It is the introduction to the whole of the remainder of the great epistle. Now, we've already considered the first verse. There we see the apostle gives us the motives why we should live this Christian life. Then having considered the motives to Christian living, we've gone on to consider the manner or the practice of Christian living. And we've seen that his great emphasis there is upon the body, the actual, material, physical body. And his teaching is that we should present that as an offering to God. It must be holy, without blemish, without sin. It must be uh, truly acceptable to God like a sweet-smelling sever going up. And above all, it must be intelligent, it must be spiritual, reasonable in the sense that uh, it isn't something dead, not something that we do mechanically, but it is something alive and spiritual. That's to be the characteristic of it. So we present our bodies and all the faculties of the body uh, to God. We say we are no longer our own, we are bought with a price, that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and therefore we must present it to him in its entirety all its parts and portions, as well as the whole. Well, now, having done that, we move on to the second verse, where the Apostle takes uh, this uh, great statement uh, a further step. Indeed, what he does here, in a sense, is to illustrate what he's already been saying. Or, if you like, he puts it from another angle and shows us why we ought to be doing the thing to which he's already exo exhorted us. And, of course... It is only as we follow these further arguments that we shall see still more clearly why we are called upon to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Now, I suggested when we uh, give an original analysis of uh, this, these two verses that here we are moving, if you like, from the realm of the physical body as such to the realm of the soul. Now, uh, I don't know what division you accept of men, but I like to, uh, at any rate, suggest that there are these three aspects. There are those who say that soul and spirit are one. Well, in a sense, I agree, and yet I think there's an important distinction between them. It's a distinction which is drawn in several places in the scripture itself, as we've seen on a former occasion. So here, I say, we are moving on to the realm of the soul, or if you like, the psychic aspect of man's life, that part of him which is expressed through the psyche. Now, this is uh, the part in man in which he is related uh, to the world in general. 
A man through his psyche, through his soul, is related to his fellow men and women. They all have souls, so we are related to them through that. But not only that, we are related also to the animal kingdom and uh, to the uh, inanimate part of creation. A man's total relationship to life in this world is that which he does through his soul. So this is preeminently the realm of relationships. All relationships, in a sense, short of our relationship with God. Now, what the Apostle tells us about this is something I want to show you, which is a very vital New Testament principle. It's uh, taught right through the New Testament. It's one of those controlling principles which we must be clear about, therefore, and which has, therefore, a quite exceptional importance. You can't read your New Testament even in a cursory manner without noticing these frequent references to the world or to this world or to this present evil world or to this age contrasted with the age which is to come or this uh, present age and the world to come. Now, the New Testament is full of that kind of distinction. And it is very important, therefore, that we should know exactly what meaning it carries. Take, let me give you an illustration or two. Take, for instance, what the Apostle says right at the beginning of his epistle to the Galatians. Listen to him in verses 3 and 4 of the first chapter. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. There it is, according to the will of God and our Father. Now there is a typical statement of this very thing. And then there is one which is probably more familiar in the first epistle of John and in the second chapter, verses 15 to 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If a man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. See, there again is the same reference. And again, there's another one in the fifth chapter of that first epistle of John. Listen to it in the fourth verse. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, you can see that in these summaries of Christian doctrine, which you have here and there, and it doesn't matter which author you deal with, you'll find that they've all got it, and they all say it. Hebrews says the men of chapter 11 consider themselves as pilgrims and strangers in the world and so on. Now, clearly, therefore, this, this, this is a most important uh, principle, a most important doctrine which is taught us in the New Testament. We are told, you see, not to conform to this world. Yeah, he gives us in the two verses the principles controlling Christian conduct, and this is a most vital one. We must not be controlled by, we mustn't conform to this world. Well, very well. What does he mean by the world? What does the New Testament mean as it goes on using this particular term and category? Well, it's important, of course, that we should realize that it's obviously not referring to the material or the physical universe. It isn't that. That isn't what the Bible means by the world. Sometimes uh, it does use it in that sense, but you'll generally find the context makes it abundantly plain and clear. There uh, is nothing inherently wrong with the material universe, and in any case, uh, nobody conforms to that. It doesn't mean that. Well, what does it mean? Well, now we can put this in a number of different ways. It means life as it is thought of, organized, and lived apart from God. That is the essential meaning of this term, world. It is an outlook, 
It is a, an organized view of life and it is a life which is lived apart from God, without reckoning with God, without being governed and controlled by God. That is the essential meaning which is to be attached always to this term world as you find it in the Bible. You see, there's a great dichotomy, there's a great division. We all either belong to the world or else we belong to the kingdom of God. So you think of the world as uh, that uh, total outlook upon life and that total way of living into which God doesn't enter. It's apart from God. So another second way in which you can uh, describe it, if you like, or define it is this. You can define it as life and activity controlled by the devil as the result of the fall. Now, I say that, of course, because of what uh, we read of in, uh, for instance, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, there it is, you see. The God of this world, he controls it. And he controls the minds of those who reject the gospel. Well, now that's another way, therefore, of looking at this. It, it's uh, the outlook, the way of living, apart from God, but which we must realize is positively controlled by the devil. The Apostle Paul again puts this quite clearly in the second chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians. Here he is describing people who are not Christians in the first three verses. You were he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, etc. But there it is. Now that is to be conformed to the world. It is the kind of life in every respect which is governed by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That again is just another description of the devil and the forces of evil. Now it's very vital, I say, that we should understand that that is what is meant by the world. But let me give you still another definition of it, a third one, which, of course, we've already found many times in working our way through this epistle to the Romans. It is, in reality, that which is uh, subsumed, if you like, under the term flesh. Flesh. The term flesh is a word we've come across many times, and uh, it is one of those technical words in the Bible. And the biblical use of this word, flesh, generally means just this worldly outlook and this worldly type of life. Now, of course, you'll sometimes find the word flesh is used of the body, or it'll even used of uh, a number of people, or of a, a single individual. But speaking generally, the term flesh, as used especially in the New Testament, and especially in these Pauline epistles, is a word that is virtually synonymous with the, the word world. Now, we, let me remind you of how we saw it, for instance, in chapter 8. Here the apostle, you see, is giving again another great summary of the gospel. Start at verse 3. What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, doesn't merely mean the physical body, you see, it's the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of, of sinful flesh. He actually did send him in a body, but he's talking here about the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't come in sinful flesh, but he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. Now then, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now there it is very clearly put in the form of an antithesis. The world is that which walks after the flesh, and that is the great contrast with walking after the spirit. 
But on he goes. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Then again, you see, as another term, to be carnally minded is death. That's the same as being in the flesh. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's it. That's to be in the flesh. That's to be in the world. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, in a physical sense, we are all in the flesh here tonight. But as Christians, we are not in the flesh. For they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And then he works it on until he comes to the appeal of verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit to mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Very well. So that a good way of looking at this term world is to say that it means walking after the flesh rather than walking after the Spirit. Now, you see why I said just now and why I repeat again that this is an absolutely crucial bit of teaching. No one can possibly understand the New Testament teaching about conduct and behavior, morality and ethics and so on, without grasping this. This is the controlling principle. And you see, it is just here that we see the absolute uniqueness of the Christian teaching. This is something that you will never find anywhere else. The philosophers know nothing about this. They don't draw a distinction between the world and the kingdom of God. They don't draw that distinction between the flesh in the, and the spirit and being in the flesh and in the spirit. They don't know that. They don't understand that. That's where they're blind. That's the whole trouble with the philosopher who isn't a Christian. He's unaware of this. The philosophers know nothing about this. The moralists know nothing about this. The humanists know nothing about this. This is the blind spot. This is where they fail not only to understand, but this is the reason why all their schemes and proposals never come to anything at all. This is the cause of the utter failure of education to solve our problem. It knows nothing about this meaning of the word world or flesh. You see, it doesn't believe in the devil. It misses the whole point. It doesn't see why things are as they are. It doesn't see the depth of the problem. It doesn't see that only one thing can possibly deal with it. So here we are dealing with something, I say, which is really very crucial. The statesmen don't understand this either. If you have a Christian statesman, he does, of course. But a statesman, quay statesman, who believes that the problems can be dealt with by acts of parliament, he doesn't understand this. And indeed, the whole legal system of our country doesn't understand this. And that is why, as I'm going to show you, it also tends to be failing completely to deal with the moral problem that is confronting us in such a glaring manner in this and in other countries at the present time. Now then, you see, therefore, we are looking here at something which is absolutely vital. A Christian is a man who looks at life and its problems in a unique manner. Nobody else can look at it as he looks at it. Now this is, of course, of great importance for many, many reasons. I've shown you how it accounts for the breakdown and the failure of other systems. But if we don't grasp this as we should, we Christians may get into trouble also in this sort of way. The moment we begin to expect Christian conduct and behavior from people who are not Christians, we have ourselves fallen into the same muddle. It is only the Christian who can even understand this, leave alone put it into operation and into practice. And that is why at various points in the long history of the church and the human race, you will find that the church has foolishly tried to impose upon men and women who are not Christians this Christian teaching with regard to conduct and behavior. I believe, if I may say so, with great regret and reluctance, that that was one of the cardinal errors of the Puritans of 300 years ago, as it is still the error in the thinking of many of their blind followers today. 
So you see, this is important from every angle. It doesn't matter which way you look at it. Now then, what is this teaching? Well, it's this. The teaching of the Bible can be put like this. That the devil and evil are exercising a pervasive and a controlling influence and power upon the whole of the life of mankind. Now that is, you see, a basic, primary, fundamental principle of biblical teaching. That the world is being governed by this malign and evil power the head of which is the devil, the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now dwelleth in the children of disobedience. But, with all the forces that he commands, you remember Ephesians 6 and so on, to which Mr. Todd was referring just now, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's absolutely basic to an understanding of the Bible. You can't follow its reasoning unless you grasp that. You must start with that. You don't understand its doctrine of salvation or any other of its doctrines unless you're clear about this. Now then, here is the teaching that the devil and his powers are controlling the life of this world, controlling its politics, controlling its art, controlling its pleasure and its view of everything that happens as man lives this life in the soul in this world of time. You see, here we are, problem, southern Rhodesia, Armistice Day, Remembrance Sunday coming. If you don't understand these things, you don't begin to understand them unless you've grasped this particular key. Here's the thing that enables you to understand it all. The clashes and the turmoil and the pain and the agony and all the trouble. Here is the one and only adequate explanation of it all. Oh, how superficial the world becomes and one sees it to be when one really understands this biblical teaching. You see how pathetic it is that men in the First World War should have thought that they could adequately explain it all in terms of the Kaiser. And then how they again repeated the same error in thinking that Hitler alone explained the Second World War. Perhaps Mussolini added to him. As if that were the explanation. It's childish. In its superficiality. And you see, taking that wrong view, they say, if only we can get rid of this evil thing, then everything's going to be all right. But before the war ends, they discover that though they've got rid of Hitler, there's somebody else rising, Stalin. And on and on it goes. But statesmen don't see this. They're blind to it. That's the tragedy of belonging to the mind and the outlook of the world and failing to understand the biblical connotation of this most important term. Well, now then, there is, if you like, uh, the teaching of the Bible with regard to what is meant by the world. We are not to conform to that. Very well, then, how does this mind of the world, if you like, this outlook, how does it reveal itself? Well, there are many, many statements again about this. I read one of them to you just now, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Well, what's that? Well, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. There's a very good summary of it. But you see, it isn't enough. We've got to say more. Now, here, I think, uh, is the appropriate point to issue a warning. There is a grave danger that many of us confine the meaning of this word world to two narrow limits. There are many people who seem to think that uh, when the Bible tells us, be not conformed to this world, that's all it is really telling us is not to, to participate in certain so-called worldly pleasures. There are many people who think that as long as they don't go to a cinema or the theater or a public house or something like that, that they, they're not guilty of worldliness. Some would almost confine it to having a television set. If you have a television set, you're worldly. If you haven't, you're not. Now, I think you know such people. And you see how small, their whole conception of this term world 
really is. Others think it's purely a matter of money. I remember quite well, that was the word that uh, I used to hear quite often when I was a boy, and particularly in another language. Worldliness, according to that definition, was synonymous with love of money, or uh, possession of money and possessions. We, we said, we, we used to say, he was a, he's a worldly man. And we meant by that simply that he was very fond of money and wanted more money, and he lived for making money and possessions. He, he was called a worldly man. Well, now, all I'm saying at the moment is that things like that, of course, are included. But you mustn't confine worldliness to that. You mustn't confine what is represented by this term world to just a handful of, of, of things which you don't do and which you say people shouldn't do. It's a much bigger term than that. You see, it's something that takes in the whole of man, his thinking as well as his practice. It's a very large and a very comprehensive term. Well, now then, the injunction to us is that we are not to conform to this world. Be not conformed to this world. Now, I want to put it to you as strongly as I can that there was never greater need of this particular injunction than there is at this moment. Indeed, I'm almost coming to the conclusion, as I said at the beginning, that the key to most of the situations in which we find ourselves as Christians at the present time is to be found in this one phrase. Now, let's look at it, therefore. Let's see exactly what it's telling us not to do. The danger we shall find, I'm just putting it as a principle now, I hope to elaborate in, it in detail later, but the principle which we've got to bear in mind is this. In our interpretation of not being conformed to this world, the danger is of going to extremes. And there are two extremes as usual. Extreme on one side and extreme on the other. The extreme of a kind of legalistic narrowness and the extreme of going so far in an attempt to avoid that as you so that you truly do become guilty of conforming to this world. And it's surprising to notice the number of Christians are in one or the other. It's always easier to be at an extreme than to hold the balance which characterizes the Bible itself and the true saint throughout the centuries. Very well, let's keep that in mind then. And having done that and going on doing that, let's look at this exhortation with respect to thinking, our thinking. Be not conformed to this world. You see, I start with your thinking. Not merely with whether you go to a cinema or not, but with your thinking. It's most interesting and sometimes can be very amusing to notice the worldliness of people who think they're not worldly because they just don't do this, that, or the other. They can sometimes be much more worldly than the people who are guilty of these particular things. It's primarily a matter of thinking, a matter of the mind. Now, we, of course, are concerned with this, primarily in the realm of the church. And I now want to try to show you that the real tragedy of the church speaking generally today is that it is conforming to this world in its thinking. How is it doing so? Well, it does so in its theology. This is the most amazing thing. Take the popular theology. I mean by the popular theology, the theology that sells on the bookstores. And you're given the numbers, the sale, the phenomenal sale, for instance, of a book like Honest to God and its successor, the New Reformation, and a book like Down to Earth, and all this that goes by the name of the South Bank theology or the Cambridge South Bank axis, call it what you like. This kind of theology that has achieved such popularity in the last few years. Now, I'm here to try to show you that the real trouble with that theology, quite apart from the details in which it is so wrong and denies every cardinal article of the Christian faith, even before you come to that, 
I say that you can show even on the first page of such books, generally even in the introduction of the preface, that it's going to be all wrong. Why? Well, because it is entirely based on conforming to this world. How do I show that? Well, I show it to you like this. This is how they start. This is always their presupposition. Why do we need a new theology? And they answer the question. They say, you know, it is no use telling the modern men. The moment they've said that, they've said enough. That's enough. They've betrayed their whole position. If a man stands in a pulpit and says, or writes a book and says, it is no use saying to the modern men. I say that man has already put himself out of true Christian theology. Why? Well, he's conforming to the world. You see, what he says is this. He's saying exactly what the world is saying. The world says we today are entirely different from all who've ever gone before us. And we are different because of our great knowledge. We are 20th century men. We've come of age. We've grown up. We are living in this scientific age, this atomic age. And of course, the latest knowledge that we've got has revolutionized everything. Man, of course, in his ignorance and simplicity used to believe in a sort of three-story universe. Of course, we know now that that is no longer possible. Now, I'm repeating their statements. They say it is impossible for a modern scientific man to believe in the supernatural or in the miraculous. He cannot do so. So, they say, if you are going to try and teach them a theology or a view of life which still goes on talking about the supernatural and the miraculous and the divine... Well, you're hopeless. The world won't listen to you and you might as well shut your buildings and shut your books and, yes, shut your mouths because the thing is ridiculous. They won't listen to you. Therefore, they say, we've got to reconstruct the whole thing. We need a new reformation. We must start afresh. We must now discover a truth that will be acceptable to this modern man in his situation. But can't you see that is nothing but conforming to this world. It is saying that the man of the street decides what is to be believed and what is to be accepted. You don't any longer approach him saying, Thus saith the Lord. You look at him and you analyze him. You discover what he believes, what he reads, what he thinks. You go and work with him and you go and drink with him. You mix with him in work and pleasure and all your life. And having discovered where he is and how he thinks, you then present him a gospel that he will be able to understand and to accept. He determines and controls what your teaching is going to be. Well, no, that is nothing but conforming to this world. And that is precisely what is being done at the present time? There's a great German theologian. You've heard his name called Bultmann. That's the whole basis of his teaching. He, he starts with a very good and practical intent. And of course, the other men of whom we are hearing so much, Bonhoeffer and so on, not so extreme, I agree, but he virtually says the same thing. It's all this idea that the modern man cannot, because he's modern men and because of his knowledge and learning, he cannot. Take this as it is. So, Bultmann teaches you must what he calls demythologize your gospel. Take out all the miracles. There's only one thing you can be certain of, he says, namely that a man, Jesus, died upon a cross. It's the only thing you can be certain of. Certainly not his resurrection in the body. Certainly not his virgin birth. Certainly not his miracles. All of that is first century and must be shed. But he did it in the interests of giving a message to the modern men. He's honest, he's sincere, he wants to do good, he wants to help people. And he says, if you do, well then you've got to drop all this, which the modern men cannot accept. But you see, that's conforming to the world. Now, the Bishop of Woolwich, the imitator of Bultmann and others, uh, and a kind of muddled gramophone record of these other teachers, uh, he, uh, he says precisely the same thing. Let's grant him that much that he is concerned to help people. All these people are. You see, that is the extraordinary thing about them. They say that if you really want to help people, well then this is the only way to do it. And they say that those of us who go on preaching the old gospel in the old way are utterly foolish. Incidentally, there's one very interesting comment that one could make on a, in a practical sense. The more they do that kind of thing, the fewer the people who listen to them. It is still a fact. 
that it is the old supernatural gospel that assumes nothing about the modern men except that he's the same as men has always been, that he's a sinner controlled by the devil who needs to be born again and can only be saved by the blood of Christ. It is such preaching that still appeals to men because it is the only truth. Well, now there it is, you see, in the realm of theology. The whole idea of the truth that is needed in this atomic age. There's one illustration, but let me give you a second. You get it even in the realm of evangelism. It's a very subtle thing, this. The apostles' exhortation, remember, is be not conformed to this world. That means don't allow yourself to be controlled by the mind and the outlook and the thinking of this world apart from Christ and without the Spirit. Very well. What then about a, a type of evangelism which says the modern man no longer likes preaching. The modern man no longer likes long sermons. But the modern man does like films. Therefore, don't preach. Especially don't preach long sermons, but give them films. What about it? The world says we like everything to be bright and breezy. We don't like solemnity. We don't like too much seriousness. Very well. What about an evangelism which says, well, now that's what the world likes. It likes color. It likes glamour. It likes a lot of singing. It doesn't like too much reason. But it likes stories and illustrations. And therefore says, let's give them that. What about that? Isn't this conforming to the world? The moment you allow the world, the man without the spirit, the man without Christ, the moment you set him up as a standard and ask the question, now what does he like? What does he want? I say, you've already violated this principle. Now, I shall be telling you again, and it's very important, as I told you just now, to keep the principle in mind that you mustn't go to extremes. Somebody may think that I'm arguing for solemnity or a lack of liveliness or a droning in a miserable manner of a service, I'm doing nothing of the sort. All I'm saying is this, that if you once grant the principle that the man in the street, the man who is not a Christian, is either to control your message or your method, you are conforming to this world. You can see the seriousness of this matter. The motive is right, the motive is good. It is to appeal to people, to attract people. But all I'm saying is this, and it is clear as daylight as a principle. If you are governed in your thinking and in your practice by what the world thinks and says and wants, and not by the truth itself as revealed, you are conforming to this world. Very well, in theology, in evangelism, but come to the realm of morals. And this is still more serious. Of course, these things all go together. If you go wrong in your theology and in your evangelism, well, your morals will inevitably follow suit. And we are seeing that very visibly at the present time. Now, here again, you see, is the basis of what is called the new morality. This teaching about the new morality is nothing but a blank contradiction and denial of Paul's exhortation when he tells us not to be conformed to this world. Its whole basis is again that it is the men of the world who decide. This is a most solemn and most serious matter. Now, this, of course, is the basis of the law of this land. At any rate, that is what is being taught at the present time. We are told that you must never legislate against the will and the opinion of the majority of the people. That is the argument. Now, this was the argument behind the famous Wolfenden Report. And now, of course, it's been passed in the House of Parliament and the House of Lords. The argument is this. If the majority of enlightened people at the present time hold the view that this perversion should not be regarded as a crime, well then you must not regard it as a crime. That is the argument. 
I could mention books to you, which deal with this in a very learned manner. It was the basis of the Wolfenden Report. If the majority opinion has changed on this matter, you must change your law accordingly. And of course, exactly the same thing has, uh, has happened in the matter of whether you hang murderers and others or not. The, the argument has simply been that, that modern man, in, with his enlightenment, he cannot take this. He cannot accept it. Now, so your laws are to be governed entirely by majority opinion. That is, of course, conforming to this world. But what is much more serious is when that kind of argument comes into the realm of the church and her teaching. And that is, of course, the very thing that is done by this so-called South Bank teaching. Not only on theology, but on morals. Now, let me give you a quotation. In Sweden, the main church is the Lutheran church. You may have read in your papers last few years about the state of that country of Sweden. Very prosperous. She hasn't been involved in either of the two wars. One of the wealthiest countries. Very prosperous, but morally in an increasingly deplorable condition. And what is so terrible is that the Lutheran church in Sweden is at the present time, I, I'm quoting, discussing seriously whether premarital intercourse must, in view of the facts of present Swedish life, be regarded as sin under all circumstances. Now, you notice what they say. They are not arguing as to whether premarital intercourse is wrong in and of itself and according to the law of God and always and in all circumstances. What they're saying is this. They're raising the question whether, in view of the facts of present Swedish life, you see, morals in Sweden have gone down and down and down. And the church is now seriously debating this. Have we a right to maintain that old standard which the church has always maintained in the light of this great change that has taken place in Swedish outlook in general? Can't you see what that is? That is conforming to this world. The moment you say, it's no use preaching any longer to the men of the world, they'll no longer take it. The moment you say that, you're conforming to this world. Quite apart from the inherent rightness or wrongness of your teaching, you are doing something, I say, which is wrong in and of itself. Your teaching is based upon the common popular opinion of men and not upon God's revealed holy will. The moment you say that what is popular or what is generally believed is the thing that is to be, con is to be controlling, you are throwing the apostle's teaching overboard. And you can see that it's not only wrong in and of itself, it means that you'll be constantly having to change your laws. Now, they say, oh, homosexuality under certain conditions is not sin, it's not crime. Very well, change your laws. Well, then something may happen and they have to change their laws again. So you're always changing your laws and there's no stability and nobody knows what exactly is to be done. But apart from all that, I say, here is the big principle I would establish before you that the biblical teaching starts with this great fundamental postulate. Man doesn't decide. Popular opinion is not the determining factor. Why? Well, our theology compels us to say that. Our theology tells us, Paul starts doing it in the first chapter of this epistle to the Romans, in verse 18 and goes on, man is formed, man is perverted. Man is not capable of judging in a true way. He's unreliable. He is a fallen, perverted creature. And his opinion is therefore of no ultimate value. In these matters, the world does not decide because it cannot decide. And we must never, therefore, allow our thinking even to be determined and to be controlled by the world and its thinking. Now, we must leave it at that tonight. Let me just add this word before I close. I do hope that nobody is imagining that what I'm doing here tonight merits the designation of obscurantism. It isn't that. I am not saying 
that you should just maintain some status quo as over and against changes that are taking place in the world. I'm, I'm going into this more thoroughly next Friday, but lest somebody may be going away with the wrong impression even here and now, that I'm just saying, dig your head into the sand. Don't pay any attention to anything that happens in the world. I'm not saying that for a single second. What I am saying is this that we've got a great basic fundamental position. And that is that the world is always this present evil world controlled by the god of this world, governed by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now dwelleth in the children of disobedience. And that the events of science and knowledge and all the rest of it does not change that to the slightest extent. And that therefore, while we are open to any fresh light or knowledge or information that comes in any realm or department, in our view of man and his conduct and his behavior, we start by saying we cannot get any help from that direction, for it is the world. And we are told, be not conformed to this world. Our thinking, our ideas, our practice, our everything is controlled from above by the revelation which we have in God's word and in that alone. Very well, we've only been able to deal tonight with the practical application of the exhortation in the realm of thinking, our theory, our theory in theology, in evangelism, in our moral ethical teaching must in no sense be determined or controlled or even guided by this world. God willing, we'll go on to the practical aspect of it next Friday night. O oh Lord, our oh God, we come again unto thee, and we come with grateful and with thankful hearts. We live, O oh God, in a world of such terrible confusion, and we thank thee that in that confusion there comes this blessed light. Oh, how can we praise thy name sufficiently again, that the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We worship him who was able to say, I am the light of the world. He that believeth in me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. O oh God, receive our humble and unworthy prayers and enable us all to live and to walk as children of the light and children of the day, and to follow our blessed leader all the way. And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now this night, throughout the remainder of this hour, short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage, and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.